Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Weddington. Let's stand and worship together. to our morning worship service. If you're a guest with us, if you haven't stopped at the connection desk on your way in, please do so on the way out. We'd love to let you know more about ministries here, get some information from you. Church family and guests, if you have your bulletin with you, I just want you to pull that out for a second. As we put up our FBCW vision statement, if you turn to the back, you'll see that we have our core values that are listed here as a church. Now, we we put a lot of time and prayer and work into this. We came together as a church body and we said, here are our values. This is what we believe, objectively speaking, as best as we can understand God's mind and what he would say about it, this is what we truly value. But we also have some other things that we think are important biblically, and those are what we call our aspirational values. It doesn't mean that we don't have some members, maybe many members, that value these items, but as a church as a whole, we are not doing the job we want to do. We aspire to have these as, as genuine values of our church. And then you see listed there as well, and what's up on the screen, is our what we call a vision statement, or I like this better, our discipleship process statement. 
but you can call it either one. And that is really born from our values, both our existing values, our current values, and our aspirational values, especially moving forward, our, our aspirational values. Uh, here's the vision. Here's the discipleship process statement that we believe God has for our church to do what? To make disciples. We've talked about this before. Every church, the way we come at it, every church has the same mission. Jesus gave every local church the same mission. That's to make disciples. But not every church is the same in how it's going to make disciples. And so when we look at our church, we say this is how we believe God wants us to make disciples. And we believe, because God's word never changes, that when Jesus looked to his disciples, was talking with Peter, he said, I will build my church. He means it. And he's still building his church today. He doesn't call us to grow his church. He calls us to be faithful to his word. And he'll build it. He'll grow it. But we want to make sure as best we can that we are doing what our Lord said. Remember his last, his last thing that he said to his disciples before he ascended. One of the very final things was to do what? To go and to make disciples. And so we want to be busy. We want to be focused on that. And that involves a lot of different things. If you look at the ministries of our church, some of those are listed right there above our discipleship statement, above our church, our, our uh, core values. There are ways that we can plug in to make sure that we are disciples, that we're growing as a disciple, that, that we are loving God and others. And we do that in a variety of ways. And we try to understand as leadership here that people are at different levels in their Christian walk. And so we want to offer opportunities for people to plug in in different ways. We're continuing to pray about that. There are individuals right now that, that are praying about different things to, to bring to our church for ministry opportunities. And we want to always be in prayer about those types of things. But be praying about yourself. How can I plug in now? What is it that I can do in terms of loving God and others? We can do that here on Sunday morning with our, with our, our worship service, loving God, Bible fellowship hour, uh, loving others, growing in fellowship, study, and prayer. You see opportunities there on the back, and our Bible fellowship hour is another great way. There, a lot of these ministries and events are ways to connect on different, what I would say, prongs of this vision statement. We want to go. We don't want to just hold this good news to ourselves. And so you see there, as we, as we serve joyfully after growing in fellowship, study, and prayer, we go share the gospel. And so we want to make sure that we're doing that as well. But when God sends people to us as a church, we want to be ready to be making disciples. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have given us a great opportunity to do that very thing. Lord, we know that when we stand on your word and when we follow your word, that we are going to be a healthy church. We're going to see things happen. And Father, it is exciting to see just a glimpse of what you're doing here. We know, Lord, there is so much more. And that, that just, it just ushers in great joy to think of all the possibilities. Lord, I just ask that you would help us to come together, Lord, to, to pray, to be in your word, to be an inviting people, Lord, so that we can honor you. We can please you. Lord, we commit this time to you right now. Help us to grow in our love for you. Help us to be faithful to your calling to be disciples and to make disciples. In Christ's name, amen. Would you stand and worship? Sing with us.
into the darkness you shine. This is Pastor Sam Roach. Thank you for joining us via live stream for our morning worship service at First Baptist Church of Weddington. We are located at 348 Providence Road South in Weddington, North Carolina. We fulfill the great commission of making disciples by loving God and others, growing in fellowship, study, and prayer, serving joyfully, and going out to share the gospel. Well, I'm glad you have joined us via live stream. If you live in the Charlotte area, I want to invite you to join us in person this coming Sunday. We have small groups, what we call Bible fellowship classes, for all ages that meet at 9.30 a.m., followed by our morning worship service at 11 a.m. So if you live here in Charlotte, I hope you will join us here at First Baptist Weddington this coming Sunday. If you live in another area, I want to encourage you to please find a Bible teaching church that you can attend in person. If you're not physically able to attend church in person, my hope and prayer is that this live stream ministry will bless you and glorify God in your life. Bye. 
God, he is good. He is the king of our hearts. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Please play with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, Lord, and we just, God, we recognize that you are the author of all things good. Father, we thank you for the many gifts that you bestowed upon us, and Father, at this time, we give you a portion of those things back. We ask that you be with Pastor Sam, Father, as he delivers your word. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Please open your Bibles to the book of 1 Timothy. Please open to 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to begin reading in verse 13 in just a moment, so just keep your spot there if you would. We're in our last in a series called, What is God Like? We're looking at the attributes of God. So this is our last in a series of about six weeks. There was a gentleman in the second century, his name was Marcion, and he did not like the Old Testament. I put this picture up because this kind of gives an image of Marcion's view of the God of the Old Testament. Marcion was a leader in the church at the time, but he decided that the God of the Old Testament was so detestable that he just got rid of the Old Testament. He said that's not part of the Bible. He, he kept the Gospel of Luke, but he got rid of all the other Gospels because they were too Jewish. He kept ten of Paul's letters, but he edited those. He thought that the God of the Old Testament was this monster and that Jesus was sent into the world to defeat and overcome the Old Testament God. Now, Marcionite, or Marcionism, the Marcionite controversy, was a big deal in the early church, and Marcion, believe it or not, was declared a heretic. But he he gained some traction. Some people liked this idea that the New Testament God was a different God than the Old Testament. Now, it may not be that clear today where we have a Marcionite controversy, but, but we need to be careful that we're not treating the the Old Testament scriptures as just Jewish scriptures and not Christian scriptures, because they are Christian scriptures. By the way, Marcion was just so wrong in his understanding of the Old Testament God. The, it's the same God as the New Testament God. It's the, the same Yahweh who was compassionate, loving, gracious, and kind. And he, he's a God of judgment in, in the New Testament as well as the Old I want us to begin reading today in 1 Timothy chapter 6 because we want in this series as we're continuing today to get our understanding of God from the Bible. And so we'll look at other scriptures as this is a doctrinal sermon, a doctrinal series, but I want to begin today with this passage. This is Paul writing to the young man, Timothy, beginning in verse 13, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen, or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Well, in that passage, Paul notes several attributes of God, and we want to look at one of those, and it's God's blessedness. We'll begin today with God's blessedness. It means he delights fully in himself and all that reflects him. God's blessedness is an attribute of God. Blessedness is. He delights fully in himself and all that reflects him. Go ahead to the next slide. To be blessed is to be happy in a very rich and full sense. The scripture talks about the blessedness of those that walk in God's ways. People are blessed when they do that. 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy Paul calls God, as we saw, the blessed and only sovereign in 1 Timothy 6.15. He also says earlier in chapter 1, he says the glorious gospel of the blessed God. In both those instances, the word that's translated blessed is not eulogitas, it's makarios. And makarios really means happy, that God is happy. God's happiness is directly connected to his own person. That's what this definition gets at. It means he delights fully in himself and all that reflects him. 
it, it's, it's, direct, it's connected directly to his own person as the focus that is all, of all that is worthy of joy and delight. It's God himself. He's the focus. And it also shows that God is perfectly happy. He's perfectly happy. And that's important to remember. He has fullness of joy in himself. And God takes pleasure in everything that reflects, that mirrors his own excellence. Remember when he finished his work of creation in Genesis chapter 131, he said it was very good. Isaiah talks of God's future rejoicing over his people. Quote, as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. That's in Isaiah chapter 62, verse 5. Now, it may seem somewhat strange, maybe even disappointing, that what makes God completely happy, what he fully delights in, is himself. Does that seem strange? Maybe at first thought. But remember, he is the sum of all perfections. It, 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 ha- it can be no other way if we understand that, that, that he is the source of everything that's good. And when we understand that, then we come to see the, the logic of it, the truth of it. He rejoices in us because it reflects his own qualities. He rejoices in the creation because it reflects his majesty and his power and his splendor. That's what God delights in. It couldn't be otherwise. The scripture teaches this. Whatever excellence there is in the universe, whatever is desirable, Grudem says, must ultimately have come from him. For he is the creator of all and he is the source of all good. It can't be any other way. And and by the way, I've been following, as I've said in previous messages, Wayne Grudem fairly closely with these attributes. I've looked at others, uh, MacArthur. A lot of them say the same things. Uh, They differ in some respects, but they're pretty much on the same page when it comes to God's attributes. Whatever is desirable. James chapter 1, verse 17 Remember what it says there? We quoted this. Every good and every perfect gift is from above. Every good and every perfect gift is from above. The stress on every, it comes down from the Father of lights. Remember what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. He he asked these rhetorical questions. He says, what have you that you did not receive? The answer is nothing. If you then received it, why do you boast as as if you did not receive it? That's 1 Corinthians 4, 7. And then we read, and this, we'll put this on the screen, in Romans eleven thirty six. 36, Paul writes, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Paul's getting at the truth that God is the source of everything that is good. And so he, he can only find his happiness in himself and what reflects his character, his nature. And you know, we imitate God's blessedness, we imitate God's happiness when we find happiness and delight in the things that delight God. Do you delight in how God has created you uniquely? In terms of your spiritual gifts, we talk about that a lot. In terms of how God's created you to use your gifts, you may have the gift of service. Do you delight in that? God delights in that. You're You're thereby imitating his happiness, his blessedness when you delight in that. How about in your your vocational setting? You're a teacher, you're a doctor, you're an engineer, computer scientist, whatever. Do you delight in your work? Do you find happiness in doing what God has created you to do and called you to do? When you do that, you're imitating God's blessedness. What about, what about this? Let's get very spiritual. Do we really rejoice when people receive Christ as their Savior? Does, does that just bring a, a happiness and a joy to us when we see people getting converted? How about families that are, that are growing in their love for God and their love for one another? How about a church that truly loves one another? Does that, does that give you happiness? God delights in those things. God is happy when those things happen. Well, we should find our greatest happiness in God. We should find our greatest joy in God himself. And like many of these attributes, the next one that we're going to look at is connected to the previous one, 
Because God finds his, his happiness in these things, because he's the source of all of these great qualities that he's happy about, it's no wonder that he possesses all of these attributes that he's happy about. And so we're going to refer to God's attribute of beauty to mean he possesses all desirable qualities. God's attribute of beauty means he possesses all desirable qualities. That's the God that we serve. That's the God that we praise. That's the God that we share about. He, de- he possesses all desirable qualities. Qualities. Now, some of the theologians will have another attribute before this. They'll, they'll put God's perfection as an attribute of God. And that's okay. We could do that, but some don't. Uh, God's perfection would be this. It would mean that God doesn't lack anything desirable. Well, beauty is just the other side of the same coin. It means that God has everything that's desirable. His perfection would mean he doesn't lack anything that, that is desirable. His beauty means that he has everything that is desirable. They're just two different ways of affirming the same truth. This reminds us that all of our good and righteous desires, all the desires that we really ought to have and see as as desirable, they're in God. They find their ultimate fulfillment in God and no one else. Psalm 27.4, I'll put that up there. One One thing have I asked of the Lord that... That will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. David is crying out about the beauty of God. He understands, he recognizes that God possesses all desirable qualities. Every single one of them is possessed by our God. A similar idea is expressed in another psalm. It's in Psalm 73. Verse 25, whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing upon earth that I desire besides you. Because if God possesses all desirable qualities, then we would, possess, we would desire God above all else. We find our, our ultimate desire fulfilled in God because of these qualities that he has. It's the sum of everything desirable, God himself. It far surpasses all. All other desires. There's a retired pastor named John Piper who has written books and and based a lot of his ministry on this idea of desiring God because he understands and recognizes that the scripture teaches that God possesses all desirable qualities. And so Piper goes to the Bible and he finds that there. Then he looks at a theologian like Jonathan Edwards who talks about the beauty of God and says, you know, we we are most glorifying to God when we're most satisfied in him because He has this attribute of beauty, this attribute of beauty. How do we reflect God's beauty? Because we certainly can. This is a communicable attribute. We've talked about incommunicable versus communicable, incommunicable attributes. God possesses those alone, communicable. We can share and we can participate in those attributes, not to the extent that God has them. We we don't have the beauty to the extent that God does, but we can reflect his character. We can. Much of the Bible, much of the New Testament, it it talks about this. When Paul writes to the Philippian church, he says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, he says he he wants the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. You've probably heard that verse. The surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. I think too many times we think that that's just intellectual. It's just dealing with this intellectual knowledge rather than the experiential knowledge. Paul is saying, I want to have the character of Christ. I see him as beautiful. I want to know him in that way. I want to have the characteristics, the character of Christ. And we can reflect God's beauty when we we display that kind of conduct. When we treat our spouses with kindness, with gentleness, when we show love to our children and and when we come together as a church family and and do those things that express love. We have a church member who part of her ministries, one of her ministries, and you would probably know this, she sends notes and cards to us on our birthdays and on other occasions. So if you haven't, if you're a newer member, to First Baptist, get ready. You're going to find out because she's going to find your birthday and she's going to send you a card. And, and she does things like that. When, when we come together, I, I think of the different ministries that we have going on with our Bible fellowship. It's a way to 
express this conduct towards people that uh, when we pray for them, we express God's beauty when we do that, when we're there to meet needs. It's also true that, that we understand this quality of God's beauty in other people. A couple of weeks ago, maybe it was last week, we had a couple of our Bible fellowship classes that after the worship service, we just got together upstairs, all the families, kids, and uh, ordered pizza. And pizza came in, so a couple of our classes did that. And it was just a good time. We were just hanging out, talking, and we do things like that. And it's not surprising, and it's really a very good thing that we should want to get together, that we should want to spend time with one another. We should delight in the presence of each other. Why is that? Ultimately, we should recognize that when we're with our brothers and sisters and we delight in their character, we delight in them, we're, we're really delighting in God. We're really seeing the beauty of God displayed in their character. And that's a very, really good thing. I, I could go on and on. I, I don't want to leave out any particular ministry because they're all important. And in various ways, they're, they're getting at this. So it's very natural and it's a good thing that we should want to come together. We should want to spend time with one another because we see God's character in our brothers and sisters. But it certainly is a characteristic of God and we want to acknowledge it as such that God, he possesses all desirable qualities. Well, it's a beautiful thing. We could say that, couldn't we? Have you ever been at a an event at our church, or I think of the diamond set, we'll talk about some experiences that we've had there. Uh, you know, it's a beautiful thing. That's a, that's a true statement. It's a beautiful thing when we come together and we enjoy our time with one another. Well, the last aspect of God that I want to talk about in this series is God's glory. God's glory refers to the created brightness that surrounds him. God's glory refers to the created brightness that surrounds him. Now, the scripture speaks of God's glory in different ways, in different ways. For example, oftentimes it means just honor or excellent reputation. I don't have this this verse, but Isaiah 43, 7, I'm not going to put it up there. God speaks of his children whom I created for my glory. What he's saying there is I created them for my honor and for my reputation. We see that throughout the scripture. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've fallen short of God's honor or His excellence. But there's another sense that the Bible speaks of God's glory. And that's what I want to get at with this aspect of God. It means the bright light that surrounds God's presence It refers to the created brightness that surrounds him. Now, God is spirit. He's not matter. He's not energy. So when we speak of God's glory this way, we're not talking about an attribute per se, not like the attributes we've spoken of previously. This is more just uh, something that is true about God. it's It's his created brightness that surrounds him. It's not not part of his being, and we wouldn't say it's his, his character, but it's, his, it's something that's created as he reveals himself. It surrounds him. And that would make sense. It's a, a brilliance that surrounds God. It's something, though, that belongs to him and him alone. So it's really not inappropriate. It's, it's really appropriate to put this after at the end point of our study on his attributes. Scripture often speaks of God's glory in this respect. David asks, who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. That's in Psalm 24.10 or Psalm 104. Psalm 104, 1 and 2. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment. That's God's glory that we're speaking of here. It's mentioned again in the New Testament with the annunciation of Jesus' birth in Luke chapter 2, verse 9. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory, the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. This, this brightness, this light in the heavenly city, it's yet to come. It says in Revelation 21, 
23. The city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. This is something that God possesses alone. It's a created brightness, and it just makes sense because we can never know God fully. We, we can never know Him as He truly is fully. We, we just never could. We're finite beings, we're created beings. He's eternal, He's infinite. And it just makes sense that God would reveal himself, this aspect of himself, as bright light. Because we we can never fully understand him, but what can we do when he reveals himself? We just need need to just glorify him. We just need to honor him. We need to praise him. It's appropriate that he would have this attribute or this aspect to himself. Remember what it said in the opening verse that we had. It talked about about God who, who lives in unapproachable light, the blessed and only sovereign. Remember Paul when he was Saul on the road to Damascus? He, he saw there was a bright light there when Jesus revealed himself to Paul. And I just think that experience, that story of, of Saul going to persecute the church, and then Jesus reveals himself to Saul with this bright light, but then with these tender words. You know, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And it just, what a great reminder that this awesome, blessed, glorious God knows every single thing about us and cares for us. He loves us. He's this awesome God. He's this omnipotent God. He's this omnibenevolent God. He's both infinite and personal. No other God like this God. He's the one true God. But let's talk about God's glory some more because This is a communicable attribute in a sense. Think of it this way. Do you know some Christians? I'm thinking of one right now. It's it's like a a light just surrounds them. They just have such a love for Jesus that it's like they just have a a glory, a a gloriousness around them. It's not not like God's, no, but, but yet they're participating in it because they have this love for God and their lives reflect Him to such a degree that it's like their light is just shining. His light is shining through them. What an awesome thing to think of, that we can participate in the glory of God in that way. Paul says it in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, that as we grow, as we become more like Christ, we're transformed in the same image from one degree of glory to another. That's an awesome thought, but that's what we should be about. Hey, that discipleship process statement, as we're growing as disciples, transformed into the image, the same image from one degree of glory to another. And we want to invite others to be a part of that as well. Well, I close with this quote and this thought. This is from Shakespeare. What a piece of work is a man. How noble in reason, how infinite in faculty, in form, in moving, how express and admirable in action, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god, the beauty of the world, the paragon of animals, the quintessence, quintessence of dust. Now, Shakespearean scholars, I understand, believe that Shakespeare was capturing the Renaissance man, the glory of Renaissance man. But to the extent that this depicts the creation of Adam, the creation of man by God, it shows the the gloriousness of man as well. Because we've been created in the image of God. We've been created in His image, and so we can reflect His glory. Now, of course, Adam didn't stay in that innocent state, in that pure state. He fell, and then sin entered the world And then all of a sudden, at that moment, misery, failure, rupture of that relationship. But, thanks be to God, He didn't leave us in that miserable estate. He sent His Son, this all-glorious, all-powerful God, Jesus, to die on the cross as our substitute and be raised three days later as an acceptable sacrifice to God so that we can have relationship with with that all-powerful, all-good God. Have you made that decision to receive Christ as your Savior? Do you see Christ going to the cross 
in your place? Are you willing to humble yourself if you haven't done it already to ask God to forgive you of your sin because of what Christ did? If you haven't, you need to do that. And if you've done that, once you do that, then you can have a relationship with this awesome God too. Father, we ask that you would work in hearts right now, God. Lift our hearts to how awesome you are, to how great you are. And Father, convict us of areas in our lives where we are not reflecting your glory like we should. Lord, we just ask that you would do business right now in each of our lives. May we take this biblical picture of who you are into our daily work week, into our traffic patterns of life, and may we be encouraged and strengthened. Lord, we ask that you would use us to be instruments and messengers of the gospel. Lord, we know that your heart, your desire, is that those that are living apart from you, they've turned from you, they're, they haven't repented, they aren't serving you, Lord, that that would change and that they would turn to you, the living God. So, Father, as we have this time of quiet, this time of reflection, Lord, do that work in our hearts. Convict us, encourage us, and strengthen us, and have your way in this time of response right now. In Christ's name, amen. Well, this is the time in the service where you can respond. We're going to have a couple of our men up front, and as we have this song of response, if you have never publicly shared what Christ has done in your life, this would be a time for you to come forward. We'd love to hear about that. We're not going to embarrass you, ask you to say anything publicly. We just want to rejoice with you. Maybe you just need someone to pray with right now. This would be a time for you to come forward. Some of our ladies will be down front as well. You can come, ladies, and, and pray with them. Maybe you need to be baptized as a Christian, biblically. You've, you were sprinkled or whatever, but never never baptized by immersion according to the Bible as an adult, as a believer. And this is the time that you want to get that right. However the Lord is working, follow Him. Stand with us as we sing. Thank you.